the bane of bureaucrats, exposing mainstream media's weapons of mass distraction. Flying under the radar and dropping truth bombs on tyranny. It's Liberty Now. Hello and welcome to Liberty Now. I'm your host, John Verd, trainer, piper, Navy diver, and Liberty lover. Welcome to the podcast for discerning minds and common sense. We'll look beyond the headlines and false narratives of the dying, corrupt legacy media because we seek the truth and we can think for ourselves. Please be sure to hit subscribe to this show on your favorite podcast player app. And don't worry about taking notes while you listen. You can get all the links, files, and show notes for this episode at libertynow.com. And believe you me, after this episode, you're going to want to do some more reading and go check out those notes. Okay, buckle up, kids. We're going for a long drive today. I know there's so much information out there that none of us can keep up with at all. And I am truly grateful that you are even here listening at all. And I hope that you and I can get the truth out there in a world that desperately needs it. We're facing unprecedented times and a battle against a seemingly invisible enemy. But the more we expose it, the more we can mitigate and fight the tyrannical technocratic new world order that wants to subdue humanity. And I say that in all seriousness. Now, I normally keep these episodes to about 30 minutes or less, but splitting out this conversation today would have broken the flow and, and some very deep discussion about what's going on in the world. So I'm really honored to have as my guest today, an author, uh, Michael Anderson. He is a historian, author, and a political analyst focused on contemporary American politics and its problems. He applies history and the analysis of political systems from the past to understand it. So I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. Without further ado, Michael Anderson, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm I'm pretty much buried in it. So yeah, you can go any direction you'd like. Yeah, awesome. Um, and uh, what was the title of your most recent book? I was looking at a couple of them. Uh, Twilight of the American Experiment: Without Moral Balance, Our Republic Will Fall. And it basically yeah. what that what that book is about is the imbalance in the media, where well. It, in all the media between uh, academia, traditional media and social media, it all leans left. And so the public only hears, well, the majority of what they hear comes from the left. And so that has an impact on people's opinions. And if the views are misrepresented by the bias, then that's a problem. Yeah. And boy, I've, I've been noticing this since I've become a little more increasingly politically awake myself. Um, I, I think what really started me down this rabbit hole probably 15 years ago or more, I was, uh, I read Thomas Malthus's essay on uh, population. And that was kind of an eye opener in that I, I don't think he was making any prescriptions per se, but, but his just cold analytical view on you know, people as, as just basically numbers. And, you know, the more I read into some of these other globalist writings, I, I realize that he's had a big influence on them. And it seems like the, uh, the elites, you know, we'll just call them the, they, we can name names, you know, Klaus Schwab and uh, Bill Gates and other people who are uh, eugenicists. They, they really seem to be concerned about, uh, world population or the overpopulation of the world, which I think has a lot to do with what we're, what we're seeing today. Do right. you, do you address that in your, in well, your books? That, it's interesting you, know? you brought that up because my first four books have been about basically about left, right conflicts. One was about the, uh, the genetic influences that make the left what they are. And the other, another one was about the right. And then I wrote a book called Tribalism in 2019. And then the fourth book, which I gave you the title of. So I've been immersed in trying to figure out how to fix tribalism and get people to understand why the left and right are different. It's basically behavioral and biological. It's genetic. They have different brains. Yeah. And so it, because they have different brains, they think differently. So the whole idea of 
you're right and I'm wrong or I'm right and you're wrong is absurd because it the other side thinks differently. So, right. and I use the United States as an example, the country to move forward has to move forward by consensus. It can't move forward by domination of one side or the other. Because absolutely each, each side in the extreme has views that are impractical and very biased. So that's why we need consensus. But what I'm getting to is my fifth book, which we may end up talking more about, uh -huh. Comes out in September. It's called America's uh, Counterfeit Democracy. Huh. Ba basically, the theme of the book is that wealthy families and large uh, international corporations run our country, not the people. Yeah. And so, right. I mean, that kind of gets into the globalism thing. Um, you know, you know, probably know what neoliberalism is. Basically, it's yeah. the view that. Uh, capitalism is sacred and everything in human society should be driven toward the efficient capitalism. And if it leaves people out, so what? Because capitalism is king. And then globalism, of course, is an extension of that. Uh, most of the large corporations in America are global and have uh, manufacturing and sales across the globe. So they try to exert their influence across the globe. And you could say that there's a... Uh, my term is power elite. Uh, that's the right. combination of the wealthy families and corporations. That term comes from a sociologist named C. Wright Mills, who wrote a book in 1956 called The Power Elite, where he first uh, he first described it. And I, I'll write down that title and uh, we'll share that with our listeners. The Power Elite. Yep. And the, who's the author? Uh, C. Wright Mills. C. Letter C, period. Right, W R I G H T Mills M I L L S. Sounds like good reading. Yeah. Yeah. Carry and so carry on. Pardon? Go ahead. Okay. Uh You're so um but the the power elite has extended itself obviously beyond any particular nation state to global a globalist um worldview. And I think my sixth book is actually going to be about neoliberalism and globalism because there are so many problems that that presents um, that I feel like I have to write about it. Um, you yeah. probably read, I mean, the um, author sort of the authoritarian direction that Europe has taken, which I, I think is amazing. I mean, this whole thing about farmers have to get rid of one third of their land or one third of their animals if they raise animals because they're causing pollution. So it's right. like this big brother uh, population ideology that the danger to me is it subverts nation state and it subverts the individual. Oh, absolutely. Um, and the, yeah. the issue with nation state is because the globalists are not accountable to anybody. Right. Well, once it's you, it's once the, you extend exactly. laws, go beyond the laws of the nation. You have no laws, basically. Yeah. And I, I start to sound like I'm I'm against free market capitalism or capitalism in general. When I when I start thinking or talking this direction that, you know, the uh, corporations are unaccountable. Yeah, because I mean, that's that's the nature of a corporation corp or body. Right. Yeah. that has all the rights and freedoms of an individual person without the accountability or the liability. So they, they separate themselves from uh, any liability, well, limited liability corporations, as an example, right. yeah. um, which, which can protect the owners, um, you know, from undue uh, burden of, of excessive lawsuits. You know, I, I, I get all that, but at, at this level, they, they end up, uh, only beholden to shareholders and profits and, you know, people or, you know, um, citizens health or anything else be damned. Right. And w where I think it gets into the, the real muddy waters or, or the, the problem area is when corporations can use their money to um, lobby and influence governments and then use the bully force of a government to push their corporate profit-driven agenda 
a perfect example is in the most recent um, COVID pandemic. I call it a pandemic. I, I think it's provable that it was intended and planned. But all that aside, um, it, it, there's no doubt that the pharmaceutical giants profited and, and used um, their influence through government agencies to suppress non-pharmaceutical remedies that were yes. cheap yeah. and, and readily available. No doubt. And, and also to um, remove themselves from the liability of the damages that their solution caused in the uh, form of the uh, COVID injection. It's, I'm not gonna dignify it by calling it a vaccine because it's an experimental mRNA concoction. But um, yeah, that, I mean, j just that's a perfect example of how um, you, corporations, you know, have have run amok. You you said a couple of statements there that could have come right out of my fifth book. I mean, it's interesting. Is that right? Because, yeah, uh, and, le and let me talk about the power elite for a second, just to sort of yeah. orient you with that. Um, the and there are various ways to measure who's in the power elite, but basically, I mean, in America, you can define um, who the wealthy families are. Wal you know, the Walton family at Walmart, and you know, it goes on and on. Sure. There's like uh, a top 400 families, I think, control 60 percent of the net worth of the country, or something, either directly or indirectly. But the point right. about the power elite is that the, I mean. Very often, these wealthy families own corporations. They either run them, they've created them, or they're major shareholders in those corporations, so they influence them. So the, right. there's this, you know, you've heard of the military-industrial complex. There's this yep. wealthy corporate complex that's even more powerful, and it's more powerful than the government. And if you think about that, like you look at, at in America, you look at uh, the Treasury Department, all the people in the treasury department are ex lobbyist consultants and academics that are, have a particular point of view and use that influence while they're in office. Right. Um, and, and the part, the power elite basically only wants two things in their life. They want to increase their wealth and they want stability. So they don't like things that could negatively impact their wealth. Uh, so they actively work to prevent those things from happening. And sometimes they make mistakes and these problems happen. But uh, the general idea is don't make waves or prevent waves from being created. So, yeah, and I, I would like to touch on that um, and see what you think. Um, you know, you, you say that they, they want stability, that, meaning a, a steady cash flow and income and, and minimal disruptions. Um, however, I, I see a major push for destabilization and fragmentation and the uh, 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 usage of the old military divide and conquer. When we see uh, increased uh, division of people like, you know, it's, it's not enough to be um, gay or lesbian anymore. It's like it became LGBT and then LGBTQ. And now yeah. amongst them, there's conservatives and liberals and 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 then it, it just continues to fractionalize and divide more and more. And uh, it, it seems like we're becoming increasingly unstable. Do, so when you say they, they want stability, do you, do you think they're or is it the same forces or maybe um, opposing forces at, at work here? But do you think it's possible that these elites want to create an instability so that they can also then come in with a, a stable solution. In no, my I, thinking, no, I think this is like a want, one world government. They want stability so they keep control and they control protect their, absolutely. Protect their assets. And let me elaborate on your question because it's a very good question. So what is going on in American society is separate from the power structure of the country in that this tribal state exists and, you know, the, the power elite probably doesn't mind the instability because that makes government fossilized, right? So the le when the left and right are fighting or Congress is equally divided and the, the ideology is controlling both sides, then you're never going to make any progress. And so right. what, what I write in my books is 
you got to solve tribalism before you fix the country. Because obviously right. the government's broken, but you can't unbreak it with two divided parts of the public. They have to solve the tribalism thing first. Now, the right. uh, tribalism, and I won't say much about the right because the right is, I mean, what's noble about the right is they have no ideology, basically. The people on the right uh, aspire to the status quo and the honor traditions. So their their role in human society is to keep a break on the left who always wants to change stuff. So right. this is try, you know, try to create a balance between the two. The left has two factions. It has a socialist faction who's trying to create a socialist state here. And then it has an identity politics faction, sort of the quote unquote woke people who right. break society down into all these little parts you mentioned. And their ideology is to address the needs of those groups individually. What's unfortunate about that approach is that when you break people down small enough groups, you don't have any power because the groups get small enough, they have no leverage or impact. And then the socialists would say, I just read a book by a communist about this whole thing and i'll be happy to give you the title if you're you're interested but oh, yeah uh, definitely the, the book is called how elites ate the social justice movement huh and the author is frederick de boer f-e-f-r-e-d-r-i-k d-e-b-o-e-r and so but basically his his argument is that the identity politics people should join forces with the socialists because economics is the way to to get power i mean if you like if you look at the you know the socialist ideology it's the proletariat against the bourgeoisie and the proletariat needs to be big enough to apply leverage and if it isn't it won't make any progress and so so socialism has always been weak in the united states because it never got popular enough um, to have any power and it doesn't have enough people that want to be a part of it. There's a lot of people on the left that don't like socialism and like they're new deal Democrats, for example. So they don't, they don't want that. So the left has a big tent with many different groups. The identity politics people are there too. And yep. this, and this goes to my fourth book because we're seeing more and more of this because the left controls all the media you know concepts yeah. like lbgtq come out of academia as theoretical ideologies but then they never get uh evaluated because there's nobody in the right that's in academia so they don't you know because in the old days you'd fight over concepts until a consensus was reached and then it could go public now they just go public and the media grab it and and right and propagandize it. Yeah, it's it's like the court of public opinion. And, yeah. you know, they, they have the loudest megaphone, <clears throat> or at least all the, the major established networks. Um, you know, a lot of us on the, the Liberty side will refer to them as, you know, dinosaur media, the, you know, the MSM. I think they're also becoming increasingly irrelevant. And I, I think part of the failure, the, the you know, the increase of fake news, uh, just blatant lies and pushing of, of single narratives. I think behind it is the desperation uh, because they're they're losing eyeballs, losing audience, um, and therefore losing revenue, advertising revenue. So they're going to sell out to the highest bidder. Uh, we saw this with COVID-19. I don't know how many, uh, comp I've seen so many compilations of uh, uh, news programs and things like, you know, brought to you by Pfizer. I mean, they, they've put millions of dollars into their advertising and they basically own the media. So, I mean, that's going to definitely direct the direction of the narrative of the media. It's going to be completely pro pharmaceutical. You can't say anything contrary, you know, or against your sponsor that it's going to affect them negatively. So they're going to be very beholden to those corporate interests that have the most money, yeah, but also that, there's seven major media companies in the mainstream media 
seven corporations and they're all kind of owned by the same people. They're part of the absolutely power elite. yes. So the yep. power and, and the power elite actually has an organization that is handles all of its research. It, it you know it's like a big think tank, but the research is it, the ideas for the research come from the wealthy families and the corporate executives. And then they do research and then that research is is publicized. But there are separate um, goals for the research, one of which is convince the American people that everything is fine. So there's, right. you know, you see all kinds of advertisements about, you know, people are happy and the economy isn't bad and, you know, all those things, that's propaganda. And oh, then absolutely. Yeah. And then there's propaganda about products and how well they work and, and, and all that. So, this comes out of the right out of the think tank that's controlled by the the power elites. Now, yeah. let me say one more thing about the power elites that I, I didn't say before. These people uh, are very well connected with each other, and the number mm -hmm. one way you can tell if somebody's in the power elite is if they went to prep school. That's the number one <laughs> correlative. Is factor. that right? Because, he's, I mean, they go to prep school, then they go to Harvard or Yale, they go to, you know, Ivy League school, and then they get a consulting job, whatever. That's the, the power elites. But they have more loyalty to the other power elites than anybody else, than to the government or to the people. Because Absolutely. Because yeah. the other power elites are just like them. They go on vacations right. together. They buy mansions together. They go out to eat together. They play golf together. So their loyalty is is there. Now, what makes that interesting is there's both Republicans and Democrats in the power elite. Right. But, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. But, yeah. But, but the their Bushes party and the Clintons, affiliation for example. is trumped by their affiliation as power elites. And they absolutely they have no 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 sense of of uh, national sovereignty, no loyalties, no patriotism whatsoever. I mean, we've seen this for a very long time, going back to uh, probably the Civil War. I, I can't remember which armament manufacturer it was. It might have been uh, Remington, one of the early ones, but they were selling ammunition to both sides. And that's been yeah. going on for a very long time. They're more loyal to, you know, their uh, corporate interests and, and the families, as you say, than they, they, they don't care at all about national interests. And then you you might be wondering, well, how long have power elites been around? It's my assertion that uh, all the way back to the beginning of agriculture, when man first uh, acquired property and was able to own property, that gave him power over other men. So ever since then, all, all human society has had a power elite operating in it because that's those are the people i mean you just look at history look at the greeks or the rome look at the romans the patricians the original three tribes of rome they had all the money and so they had all the power right. and so right. it's it's not it's like a human society condition once you get a group of humans together that's large enough to make a society it requires a government and that government is going to be controlled by wealthy people and the the wealthy elites, you know, we we were living until not that long ago uh, in human history, maybe what three hundred years ago, in um, predominantly around the world, the the societal structure was around um, serfdom, you know, yeah. kingdoms and and serfs. Yeah. And what once the introduction of free trade came along, and and capitalism occurred, where where somebody could uh you know invest some money or time in into the production of something and, and have enough to share with others and they could start trading amongst themselves then they became less dependent on the kingdoms and um you know eventually we had the the magna carta and then led to the uh, constitution of the united states and you know freedom unheard of in world history and you know just for the last couple hundred years we've had well, you know un, undreamt of wealth yeah based the, on the key the key there was the enlightenment the enlightenment was 1650 to 1800 and what uh -huh. that did is for the first time western society recognized the value of the individual over the group because individuals right. never had rights before 
So once right. people got rights and there were constitutions, there could be voting. And that's when political parties appeared because they didn't exist before that. They had no, right. since the people had no representation, there was nobody to vote for. And, you know, they, they right. the uh, nobility represented the king, basically. Yeah. And I, I've been reading a little bit of Von Mise recently, too. And he was he's talking about how at, around this time of the Enlightenment, the the power elites uh, began to lose control. And then the prices of uh, production and and wages started to increase. And they didn't like that very much. It started cutting into you know their profits and their their wealth. And they've resented it ever since. And I feel like, you know, there's been a long term plan to pull us back into like a, a neo feudalism now and put us back under the control of the power elites. And I just I, I hope and pray that that genie cannot be put back in the bottle. But that seems like what's really being pushed. Yeah, well, I really worry about the. You know, we talk about globalism. I worry about the direction Europe's going in because they, I mean, and the WHO which is about 75% uh, supported by Bill Gates. And, and so yeah, he's yeah. How about that? Tremendous I don't think a lot of people realize. Right. But I mean, they, they come out with stuff like um, the next pandemic will be ready because we're going to have digital IDs for everybody. And we're going to make sure everybody gets vaccinated because we'll be able to control it. So right. people who don't get the vaccine will be isolated. So, I mean, there's this master like Nazi plan. I mean, there's, yeah. you, could, you could read it right in Mein Kampf, what these people are intending to do. And the same thing around the climate. I mean, yeah. It, Oh yeah. It's just oh. crazy. It is. And it's, it's crazy. And I, I think there's so many vectors we're being hit by, but the, the climate agenda is one of the, those big ones that, um, they use to control. I remember I'm old enough to remember as a kid that we were being told we need to worry about um, global cooling and it's the planet is getting so cold, you know, that they may not be able to grow crops, um, you know, by the time you're an adult and, you know, we're going to enter a new ice age. And then that, of course that never happened. And then yeah. it started becoming, um, Oh, global warming, global warming, you know, through yeah. the, I guess, 80s and 90s. And and then, it, you know, that fraud was exposed and, and now it's climate change, yeah. change. It just any change is bad. <laughs> it's right. incredible. But with regard to uh, Bill Gates buying up all the land, you know, they're, they want to control all of the production of crops and be able to use uh, GMOs because, you know, they're more profitable, higher yields, lower nutritive value, of course. Uh, along with everything else and then uh, be able to oh, and then they've got these uh, terminator seeds so you have to continually buy more uh, seeds so you know again no end to their profit streams but with regard to uh, cattle and you know using climate change as an excuse for reducing the number of cattle uh, you know their methane production or whatever I, I think behind that there there may be some people might think this is a stretch, but I don't think too much. There, uh, beef consumption is good for the the human mind. Um, you know, they there have been um, anthropologists who said, you know, that the consumption of meat is what led to the development of such large brains. Yeah, and um, yeah, and and you're talking about. Uh, some of the genetic differences between the the left and the right, and just in people in general, I think that loss of uh, consumption of meat can lead to you know eventually lower IQ scores and and things like that. And yeah, uh, I mean, too much... I, I, I read a lot of anthropology. Um, my theory is, if you look at what human beings have eaten through most of their history, um, that'd be a good thing to eat. Because, because that's, right. you know, our bodies developed to eat and meat is part of that. Right. Well, we, so. we got here doing some things right, you know, and, and reached the, the peak of civilization somehow, uh, you know, I think they that's didn't one have of those any things. bread, so they didn't eat any carbohydrates. So they didn't get fat. Right. Those carbohydrates are bad for you. So. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, going back a little bit to, 
you're uh, you're talking about the genetics of the left right paradigm. Um, it, it is interesting. I I do think that there is a world. I think it might be nurture and nature. I, I think there may be some some genetic or physiological differences. If on the whole, I mean, of course, there's always exceptions, and it it's hard to um, quantify. But there are just some interesting things I've noticed over the years. One of one study that stood out in mind was somebody was looking at physiological differences between politically left and politically right men. They just wanted to do like a, an objective study. One, one of the things that they noticed in, in physiological measurements was uh, bicep size tended to be larger uh, in pol right politically minded men and smaller in the left. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it, it's gotten me thinking, you know, is, is there anything to that at all? And I, I think sort of as an extension of that, if you feel that you're less in control or not as strong, uh, you, you would be the kind of person who's more dependent on, um, a parental figure or the state or mm -hmm. welfare, or be in favor of those kinds of things more than somebody who's more physically capable and confident and able to fend for themselves yeah. and more independent minded. And, and I think there's something there and I'm not, you know, of course I'll, I'll be accused of all kinds of, you know, ridiculous conspiracy theories, you know, when you talk about that, but I, I think there is something to that in, well, in that sort me, of mindset. Let me talk about their origin because the origin has been described. Um, obviously the left and right, uh, our behavioral differences, uh, and they developed, you know, per, perhaps a million years ago, uh, when man left, well, man left Africa only 60 or 70,000 years ago, well, it wasn't a million, a million years ago, but these behavioral tendencies were developed before that. But basically the story is when man encountered heterogeneous environments, he had to have ways to adapt to different environments because if you had a certain way of living and you got in the wrong ecosystem, you wouldn't survive. So right. what developed is these two personality types. One likes change and one doesn't like change. So mm. the, the ones that like change wanted, were willing to go find food and the other side wanted to manage food. They're more conscientious and better managers. The others were more uh, adventurous, uh, open-minded, and et cetera. So both those groups were, in, you know, in human groups at that time were 50 to 150 people. They were egalitarian societies, and they could make decisions even though they were different points of view by consensus because there was no government. Like the, the right. chief of the tribe decided or they voted or something like that. But if you take it, take an example where you've only got left people, they would all be killed because they would do too much hunting and would all you know be killed. If you had right people, they wouldn't do enough hunting and they'd probably starve. So it kind of points to the fact that th there's a balance, there's a behavioral balance there, and the the genetic portion of that is perhaps one half, you know, 0.5 or something. And the, re and the uh -huh. rest is behavioral because there's so many things that are being discovered that are that way, you know, that genetics mean a lot, but they don't mean, they don't mean everything. It's not a, you know. Right. I, I do genetic. think environment plays, plays a role. I, uh, on that line of thinking, have you read um, Guns, Germs and Steel? No, by I've Jared read a lot about it, but I've never read it because I think I disagree with the author's philosophy. But I should, I should. Okay. Read it. Yeah, it's and like, I, you I, know, that's just a uh, unknown, a not qualified opinion on my part. Yeah, well, I, and I, I do question. I mean, I question everything, but um, since having read it, um, and the more I learn, I, I do question his premise. But he he also makes some very compelling arguments uh, in favor of environmental influences over the development of technology. And one of the things that he argues is that um, in the Americas, 
uh, with the, you know, the native, the Aztecs and, and other tribes uh, living in, like in the Andes and stuff, they, they had uh, very structured, organized societies, but they didn't have the opportunity to develop the technology and spread it um, because the, the Americas are oriented in a north south orientation, uh, you know, on the globe and climates, uh, environments change, uh, you know, from from north to south, but not from east to west. So you have right. more opportunity to spread um, invention, innovation and um, and grow as a, a society and population in an east west sort of orientation because you have uh, stability of crops and um, homogenous society and hom homogenous um, food production. And so Europe was more uh, geared, you know, the, the, the layout of, of the land masses are more east west. And so yeah. you could have that more explosive growth of population and, and thus more innovation and technology and, and those kinds of things. No, was, I, I was agree one with, of the sort of I agree with yeah, that. It was, I mean, it there, was interesting. The, the, there were, I guess, five principal ancient uh, societies that all started about the same time. Mesoamerica, which is Middle America, the Incas, yep. Uh, yep. Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, and China. And so they all developed because the circumstances were right for them to, to be able to grow crops. And right. they didn't, people didn't know how to farm then. So like in the case of Mesopotamia, they settled around the Tigris and Euphrates River because there was an alluvial plain there and floods would come in and then go out and so the the soil was always hydrated and so they could take a stick and and make a groove in the in the mud and plant seeds there and gets you know you don't have to have a plow you don't have to have anything and that's kind of how agriculture got started but they right. were you know mesopotamia is kind of in the middle of everything and so that it was t uh, taken over by people coming from the West and the East and all that. Yeah, it, it is really interesting. And um, so interesting how we've gotten to where we are today. It almost seems like we're regressing in, in some ways rather than progressing with uh, the worldwide chaos. I, I, I have felt for some time now that we are entering a, a global historic change like a paradigm change or like maybe the end of history i don't know what uh, there's a lot of names for it what do you agree that that we're entering some kind of change unlike any other we've seen in history and b what would you call it um i agree that that's happening uh it's very hard to get a feel for what it will be and and what what's happening to me is that Capitalism is failing, not because it doesn't, it alleviates poverty and starvation. I mean, it's well documented, the good things about it. But yep. uh, the way power <laughs> is is wielded in Western societies is not satisfying the public. They, they become more isolated from the public. And so they're, the people are unhappy. I mean, that's why there are these right, right. right leaning uh, leaders, you know, being elected around Western Europe. And of course, Trump is an example of that. Uh, populism occurs when people decide that neither party is effective. So they look to right. somebody else that's on the out in the outside who isn't. And in his case, he's not he can't be bought. So he's even more attractive because everybody else is bought. And right. So, and so, and then the same with the third parties with, you know, RFK Jr. running. Third parties and populists evolve because of dissatisfaction with government. And our government yeah. is completely ineffective, partly because of tribalism. But, I mean, it's also, you know, lobbyists have the power. They dictate to uh, the representatives how they're going to vote, what the issues they're going to vote on and how they're going to vote because they're financing their campaigns. You know, the public. Yeah, is I I guess if I had any complaints about capitalism and I'm I'm still a diehard free market capitalist because it's maybe the the best house in a bad neighborhood. 
to quote Alex Jones, but uh, I think it's it's the best system that we've had for governance ever. But I think a fault is its corruptibility or its its capability of of being compromised, as we see it it has been. But as as a as an ideal, as a, a way of running a society, I think it's the best thing that that we've been able to come up with. And I'm certainly not going to. Um, turn towards, you know, Marxist thinking or, or socialism or communism as a solution. Right. And, and this, it's funny, I quote it in my new book, I quote Winston Churchill. He's the one that said, uh, it's the worst kind of political system ever devised, but it's better than all the other ones, which is exactly, I, I don't know if you heard that, but um, yeah, yeah, no, but, I absolutely, but yep. the point, and I make this point in my new book, the, the point I'm trying to get to is that never have democracies been challenged the way they are now and never yeah. have they become as ineffective and isolated from the people as they are now and right. th no point in history has this crisis existed because there weren't you know before the democracies there were monarchies and and dictators and everything. it's this type of system didn't exist Right, there were no, no freedoms and all that. So when you break down a democracy, what happens? The one sentence answer to why do governments collapse is when they fail to govern. But right, what happens when in a modern democracy or postmodern democracy when the uh, government fails to govern? It breaks down. But what does it break down into? I mean, you can't assume that they'll become socialists. Because, and there's a whole story about that um, that I've written about. Socialism has been ineffective every time it's been tried. And the few times right. it's been it's effective, a, yep. like Cuba and North Korea and stuff, every time it's been effective, it transitioned to totalitarianism in the middle of the uh, takeover. Because totalitarians don't have any concerns about violence. And so they use right. violence to take over where socialists are a little too nice and they just hope that they're going to convince a majority of people to go their way. And there's never a majority. So, right. I've thought about these sort of different um, systems of governance, you know, from from capitalism and democracy to uh, socialism, to communism, to outright totalitarianism. And I I think one of the biggest uh, factors as to whether it's successful, I, or or I should say, least least damaging to to the individuals in in that society is is a question of scale. Using the example of the smallest social unit, the family, that's basically a dictatorship. Yeah, uh, or you know, it should be right. Yeah. Um, because or an aristocracy have... between the parents, I guess. Or, or, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. And then you can, within your neighborhood, have um, or up to groups of maybe 300 people, like uh, kibitzes would be an example, where you can have somewhat of of a not a dictatorship, but but a, a more of a democracy or a democratic di dictatorship where everybody knows each other. You know, yeah. there there can be you can have a I, I guess it would be like an ideal. Um, scenario Utopian for, for socialism or, or communism, yeah. like a, a commune yeah. when when everybody knows each other and there's yeah. accountability. But but once you scale that up to larger and larger groups where you don't know each other, then there, there can be no trust or social contract or it's too easy to to break that trust that, that might the, the idealists who love the idea of communism. That's that's fine if you want to have a group of two or three hundred people and you're all on the same page. But right. when you try to apply that to a nation uh, like the former Soviet Union, where you, you're spanning 11 time zones of, yeah. of human beings, and you've got within the, every time zone a different dialect, different ways of doing things, different businesses, different politics. You know, you're, you're, you can't govern from a centralized, uh, you know, communist system that way. And it, as you say, it just fell apart like yeah. every other time. Right. So, yeah, I, I do think it it's it's kind of a. What you're getting to of scale. is I've written about, which is basically political morality. And people have their own personal morality, which dictates, obviously, the way they behave and how they live. 
Right. Um, when the organization of people in the society gets big enough, the personal mo morality is replaced by a public morality, which is basically the laws and the operation of the government. So as an individual, you may disagree with the public morality, but you choose to live in that society because enough of it is satisfying to you that you want to stay there. But Right. I think in today's climate, though, we have the... I think the majority of the people are completely disgusted with our current political climate uh, and the way they they have tried to seize power. I mean, it's it's become like a a self sustained like an organism that that has its own sense of self preservation and it's growing. It I would like a cancer, and it's going to kill the rest of us if we allow it to continue to grow as it is. And I think. In the case of Trump, politically, like he he probably wouldn't be a viable candidate if things were uh, stable and everybody was happy. I think he's more of a symptom or a response, yeah, exactly. Yep. Than than um, you know the it, it takes such an extreme personality to to stand up. I mean, we it's almost like the time for diplomacy and um, calm discussion is is kind of gone. Yeah. And and it, it takes like a, an extreme like. Hey, I, we're just going to, you know, do things in the national interest this way, because that's, you know, I think it's what the majority of the people want, or they're at least disgusted well, with. There's the, a lot of people attracted to him, and obviously he has a ton of shortcomings. But a lot of people attracted to him because people like a strong leader, and they want right. somebody that'll do something versus the uh, the current crew who don't do anything. I mean, it reminds right. me of that, and I don't know if you've ever heard this. If you do a poll in russia and at any time this decade the prior decade whenever you say who's the most the greatest leader russia's ever had it's very high percentage stalin the trains yeah. ran on time and people can <laughs> you know if people can exist in a society and they feel somewhat uh, satisfied the way the society operates they're not going to complain about it I mean, right. I know there were a lot of shortcomings to the communist system. I'm just saying that if something is corrupt and you know it and you can live with it, you can get by. Right. It's I, I just I don't think it's ever satisfied, though. The the corruption and the power always seeks more. You know, uh, um, what is the quote? Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Yep, or, yep. exactly. Yep. Yeah. A, a couple of things while we have uh, some time left before we go too long, I wanted to touch on the red blue paradigm. It's it's now like sort of a us versus them uh, sports team mentality and the, the whole red, right and blue left. I, I don't remember colors like team colors being associated with Republicans and Democrats as a kid. And I don't know when it, that shift happened. But have you noticed that? Yeah. And when did it I occur? I think it's only 10 or 20 years ago. Because, I mean, yeah, it was it, the elephant and the donkey were the two right. symbols, but they weren't colors. They were right. just, yeah. I just noticed, like, one year I was looking at, like, the, the polls, you know, on, on election night, and, and they were, like, red team, blue team. And I'm like, when did that happen? It just sort of snuck in, and I just suddenly became aware of it. But it was... Yeah, but it's it's a very uh, polarizing thing, and and it I think also points towards your whole idea of like tribalism. You say that America is becoming or is now tribal. How how did that happen, and and when did it happen, and why? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, multiple <laughs> answers. You know, I'll start by talking about the Congress lost its middle in the '90s. There used to be moderates who. Uh, mediated discussions and debates between the right and left and got people to compromise. And they're all Yeah, gone. I don't hear the term moderates anymore. They're gone. Now that you mention it. Yeah, they're <laughs> only ideologues in, in Congress, which makes it harder to get consensus because there isn't anybody that's willing to work with the other side. But the, right. the fact that Congress is that way is not... Co Congress's makeup and behavior is not... Uh, influence the American people, the American people's behavior influences the Congress because the government only does what they perceive the people expect. 
so you know the tribalism started and and i think the simple explanation is the left wants change quickly more quickly than the right wants change and so uh -huh. the ba the battle in the right is very reactionary because it thinks the left is going too fast so right. they formed their own tribe in relation to the left tribe to fight back because of things like i mean the left tends to discard religion. They say people are religious or stupid because they believe something that isn't true. So if right. you're on the right and you're an evangelical, you're not going to like hearing that. You're not going to support somebody that would say that. So right. and, and in my tribalism book, I've got a chart that shows like these people are all on the right and these people are on the, like farmers are on the right and small business owners are on the right. And Abortion is pro-abortion people are on the left. And I mean, you could just make a, a big diagram of all the groups and it's basically ideology. And the other thing is everything in the country became political, which contributes to tribalism and it's helped along by social media because social media, oh, yeah. social media has no filter. And it's the first time in human history that crazy people have had a global forum you know 25 <laughs> right. years ago if you wanted to have explain some crackpot theory you had to go to a park and get on a soapbox and talk because right. there, you couldn't get into the media you know you're not going to be interviewed by nbc news but right now on social media you can say anything you want you can make yourself an influencer you can get rich by saying controversial things that get a lot of eyeballs. I mean, it's it's a horrible development, basically, because there yeah. is no control. I I um I have mixed feelings about that because obviously, you know, we we don't like the things that we disagree with uh, when they confront our our personal identity. And that's I think the danger of of um, identity politics. You know, you shouldn't attach yourself your personal self to uh, a, a a political party or, or any kind of affiliation, because then you, you can't argue with it because it becomes a personal attack on you. Yeah. You know, and you get a visceral personal reaction from that. But um, I, I also think that, you know, we need to respect the freedom of speech. And as you say, though, that that platform for freedom of speech has become much larger and we are in a different era now with the advent of, of this interconnectedness and global communication. But I still think that, it, you know, it's important that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of censorship, even though I may disagree, you know, violently with, a, you know, a lot of, of what's being put out there. But it do, it still seems to me, though, that censorship is occurring and it seems to favor the, the left narrative. The big tech companies are, um, you know, part of that mainstream media and you do see them pushing and influencing towards whatever their agenda is. And again, uh, probably very often highly influenced by the power elite at the root of it. But yeah, it's uh, interesting the way the Silicon Valley has influenced the power elite because the power elite historically has been conservatives because the, that was where the wealth was. But hmm. Silicon Valley has produced so much wealth, they've created a great deal of influence and they're heavily involved in the power elite both from the standpoint of being rich members of it but because they control technology and technology is essential to the power elite because it's the media and and computational devices and all that kind of stuff phones and all that so they well, have it's a tool of control power. yeah they yeah absolutely control. moving to uh your blog you recently posted a blog titled Aldous Huxley revisited, uh, talking about the importance of his writing. Uh, was that an allusion to his his own book, um, Brave, Brave New, New World, World Revisited? Brave New. Oh yeah, I made yes, I did. That was a parody. It was an allusion parody, to that. Allusion. Yeah, yes. I I've been meaning to read th that second book of his. I did read Brave New World, and I've also read um, 1984, and they seem to be two slight not slightly, but very different uh, dystopian futures. I think that, uh, who's the author of uh, 1984? Uh, George Orwell. George Orwell, thank you. 
Um, I think that he was trying to warn society through his writing. Aldous Huxley, I'm not sure if he, with his ties to the elites, was he advocating for his dystopian future or or was he warning? He was or, warning. or what are your thoughts on that? He was he warning? Was warning. And the Brave New World Re- Revisited, it's funny you talked about those because I read 1984, Brave New World, and revisited all within the last six months because I wanted to... And then I wrote about Orwell also. I published an article in uh, Quillette about about Orwell. But uh, very interesting. I mean, Orwell's 1984 is scary because you, I mean, yes, it is right in your face. Where the yeah. world is a little more abstract because the society is, you know, in a steady state. And I mean, they've solved all the problems of getting people to behave. And I mean, like a sanitized right. society, but even though it's evil. Um, right. And so, but Brave New World Revisited is very interesting. It's a novel, actually, but it reverses a lot of what's in Brave New World. Like I said, interesting drugs to make people behave. In Revisited, they use drugs to achieve euphoria. So they have uh. like a pleasurable versus a controlling... Uh, function. Interesting. I did a podcast episode a while back um, titled Brave New World versus 1984. Do you see society heading towards one or the other right now and and why? Or or do you see them both coming to play? Well, you got, I mean, I think you got to solve the problem of what happens to democracy to answer that because they're both totalitarian worlds. So, you you know, if you imagine that uh, some Western societies could become totalitarian, um, then you would have that in the extreme. But it's not that easy to go totalitarian. I mean, the circumstances that Hitler operated under were quite unique. And I'm sure you've read about that. I mean, the economic yeah. situation of Germany right. and a very strong uh, communist party there, socialist party, and basically, the Germans voted for Hitler to avoid voting for the socialists. I mean, they picked a less what they thought was a lesser of two evils, and right. that turned out to be a big mistake. But you've got to have there's kind of a rule book for how you've got to take over a, a political system, and one of the most important is you got to have the military. And so, like right. in Amer- America, the military is, I, I don't know emasculated if you want to use that word in oh, relation absolutely to you can use that word i've it's it's yeah pretty evident if you look at <laughs> there was some uh air force some very woke air force recruitment ads that came out a few years ago that definitely attest to that but i mean even the fact that it's the the military is controlled by the civilian government is a key important factor in keeping the society under control because it lowers the opportunity that, like, if you had a general who was, I, I don't know, president or something, you got a big problem because then he right. could just take his own military and create havoc. So, um, right. I mean, if you're going to change a society and, and we're imagining that somehow a one of the current democracies gets overthrown, you got to have a military and you've got to have a, a influential, well, you have to have a part of society that is organized and desiring change. And um, right. you know who, who Hannah Arndt is? She she I, was a philosopher and a psychiatrist, and she lived in the, she wrote between the 20s and 40s, but she wrote a great book on totalitarianism, hmm. which you should read if you're interested, because she okay. describes exactly how you get there. And okay. Hitler used that. I mean, you you have to start with the largest block of people in society that have the same opinions, which are basic workers who are not educated and can be influenced. So you got you build off that and then you add useful idiots to it because there's another large group of the public who want to be part of a winning team 
and are heavily influenced by, you know, propaganda and all that. And you put those two together and then uh, she suggests you have to have a scapegoat, which in Hitler's case was the Jews, because you have right. to have you have to incite part of the revolutionary organization to uh, want to overcome some entity that is evil and represented as evil as the Jews were. And that's an additional motivation. Then you stir right. all that up with violence and you're done. You got a totalitarian government. And so right. if any of those components are missing, you're not going to get there. Um, yeah, I I really wonder. I, I see a number of, of potential scapegoats. I mean, well, uh, Biden keeps throwing out the the massive threat of white supremacy, which, you know, I, I, I never heard so much it, about that since. It doesn't um, exist. It doesn't exist. There are white supremacists, certainly. But oh yeah, the average uh, conservative is not a white supremacist. Most no, people absolutely are, not. Most people who are educated understand that you get the value out of people that you interact with based on their mind, not the way they look. So absolutely, I mean, the left has flipped Martin Luther King, who wanted to don't judge me by my color, and now everybody's judged by their color. So if I know that they've they've undone all the work that Martin Luther King. Did. did and it used to be like the democrats and the liberal the neoliberals that were so in favor of him and now it's flipped around and it's like the left has become fascist and communist it it's it's weird like yeah. just the inversion that has happened um i i really encourage people to please read i think a lot of our it has contributed to the downfall of society, in my opinion, that people read less and less. They're just consuming mindless dribble on social media and television and me other media and not putting forth the actual effort to read things that matter. Yeah, that's one and, of the worst things about tribalism is for the uh, simple minded if you, it's very nice to be in a tribe because you don't have to think. Somebody did all <laughs> the thinking for you. All you have to do right. is I'm in the blue tribe and hell with everybody else. And right. all, so you get into like this, you know, mind spiral thing where you become less engaged than you were before you got in a tribe. Right. Well, sometimes, you know, folks thinking hurts a little bit. It strains you, but it's like, you know, exercising any or any other kind of, Thing that requires some effort but i think it's uh well worth it um you know just i keep telling people read damn it if you want to argue with me you know I, I i'm more conservative um and classically liberal though um and and very tolerant but when i when i get arguments from the left about things i'm like have you actually read anything about that have you read any actual history right. and usually it's no no clue can't can't be bothered to think or, or ask questions. Um, I should. That's I don't frustrating. Where this, but there are organizations that have been uh, put together to fight against tribalism, and I want to mention one because I'm blind okay. to it. It's called Braver Angels. Ah, okay. And uh, I joined in at the end of last year, and I'm going to go to the. Con they're having a convention in June this year, but basically, Braver Angels is a. Uh, um, number of local groups because it's organized by city who put left and rights together to debate issues to reach a consensus. So there are rules oh, wow. about, and the meetings are usually split, split, split offs and to pairs, a red and a blue, and they pick issues to debate and they agree to not use, you know, raise their voice, politeness, I was just going to say, you, how is there not screaming? <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Well, I, one of the things I've discovered since I'm in it is the people that joined it are not the people that need to join it because the right. people that yeah, join yeah, it yeah. are open to consensus. Right. Right. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. What is the best website for folks to go to or the best URL for you? Uh, it's just MikeAndersonsBooks.com. And Anderson okay. has an S and books has an S. So it's Mike okay. Anderson books. And my sub stack is Mike A. Uh, 
let's see, mike0418.substack.com. Awesome. Cool. I've, I've got so many more questions for you, Mike. I, you know, we might need to do another episode uh, no in the not too distant future. I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you again, Mike, for being on the show. And uh, folks, until next time, uh, just please be good. 